Welcome back to the world of animated mockbusters. These quote-unquote films are made for one reason, to exploit and profit off the publicity of another movie, quite often Disney movies. And almost always they tend to be low-budget nonsense garbage piles with quick production to maximise profit. But surely in the modern times of 2020s they've faded away. Not so. So let's check out the worst modern animated rip-offs. For this list, we'll focus on modern as in 2016 plus, but we'll try and focus on 2020 plus. This is sort of a follow up to my worst animated ripoffs from seven years ago. Anyway, let's begin. Let's start with number seven Cargo from 2017. You probably remember Pixar's Cars, that insanely popular kids movie that's been played on repeat since 2006. Whether it was your younger siblings or yourself or your kids, there's a very good chance you've seen Cars many times. And in 2017, when Cars 3 was released, it spawned this cheap knockoff attempt to capitalise on the success. They didn't even change the original title, they just added Go to the end. Cargo scored an amazingly high 3 out of 10 on IMDb. Yes, 3 out of 10 is pretty astonishingly high for one of these mockbusters. Let's see what all the high praise is about. Oh, it was made by the creative studio The Asylum. I suspect that's going to be a blatant insult to a real insane asylum's creative talents. Why yes, yes it is. Get used to these jokers because they're our modern equivalent to video brinquado. Oh jeez, all these years and I still can't say that stupid name. Anyway, the animation is slightly terrifying. At least the original Cars Life from 2006 just looked like someone vomited up onto a canvas. You can at least comfortably look at Cars Life and say, that's bad. This monstrosity will make viewers legitimately uncomfortable with these uncanny and creepy dead-eyed car stares. The cargo world is a creepily stagnant, silent, robotic place. And we can hear this disturbing ever-present singing in the background with the silently moving lips of the badly animated cars. I mean, look at this part here and tell me you don't feel a little unnerved. The folks live in garage houses, a lovely tree-lined street. We always smile and beep hello to every car we meet. I don't know how exactly to label this animation, but I feel like these cars are going to kill me while I sleep. I think this opening song is meant to be charming, but this looks more like the crowded chanting chamber of a fervid death cult. <laughs> Would you believe the voice acting for this one is actually okay? I was shocked. They carry this movie. And by carry, of course, I mean drag along a decomposed bone pit corpse. Cabigail, I went racing with Vin yesterday instead of studying. The story? What story? It seems to be about a couple of high school kid cars in high car school. Danny the grey car gets caught up with the punk car. With blonde car... What am I watching? They wag school and... Just a teenage... Oh, why would you get them to sing? At this point, the kids have already realised that Grandma was swindled. Why rub salt in their wounds? Enough, enough. The voice acting is the only reason I give this movie anything more than a generous one. I don't even like Cars to begin with, but jeebus I am missing the comfortingly boring world of Cars at this moment. I promise not to insult the car movies again. For 10 minutes. <laughs> I'm good at these. Number six. Caroline and the magic portion. They call you Coraline instead of Caroline. Oh no no no, not Coraline. Easy mistake to make. We're watching Caroline. You know, the title that Coraline hated to be called and kept correcting people on? It's Coraline. Uh, Caroline what? Coraline. This is a uh, ma magical adventure in the uh, photoshopped world of Blender stock shapes. Look, it's the first flying snail. With the magic she finally did. Slightly modified to look kinda sorta like Coraline, provided you're blind. You remember how Coraline transported the viewer into a bizarre, twisted, distorted alternate world with a demented streak? Well now instead of that we have Coraline's ugly stepsister puppet. And a completely senseless, random story with singing snails that somehow still manages to be both boring and annoying, while running at 3 frames per second. Because I guess 4 frames was just too taxing on the $5 blender budget. The dialogue on this one is poor. Even for a mockbuster, it's poor. And I have the caravan. 
What about the girl? The story isn't so much delivered as so much spewed out an exposition. Caroline stole a magic potion from her grandma that makes her fly. Thus she turns an umbrella into a flying broomstick. So a fly barella? I don't know. But you know, this is actually my favourite concept for a mockbuster so far. There's nothing more freeing than the idea of being able to fly. And Coraline's plastic reject mannequin sister getting that power? Well, I might not loathe the next 78 minutes of my life as much as I thought I would. I was wrong. Coraline is about the only voice that's somewhat acceptable. I deserve to be punished, not her. But everyone else sounds like they're drunk while coughing or husking into the microphone with the most unconvincing performance since King Kong ate Jane's lipstick. Like, enlighten me. What voice is this meant to be? The neighbors let us use this square every year to celebrate the healer's fair, you bully. Why are men playing the roles of lady characters? Then I understood why. Because of the two lady voice actors they had, one was Caroline and the other did not speak English. I'm not fully convinced she speaks human. <laughs> what is that idiot doing? Idiot doing? What is that intonation? Even Zim gives a more convincing impression of a human being. <laughs> Oh, interesting twist to Caroline's character is she's now a phone junkie. She just can't seem to get off the thing. I actually like this detail because it feels kind of more realistic. I could see the real Caroline being kind of distracted like this too. That sounds exciting. On the plus side, within 13 minutes, we do have our flying Caroline. So I guess I got what I wanted. Though saying that might imply that any of this is not directly out of Henry Selleck's worst nightmares. Story-wise, Caroline has to rescue her grandma after the Martian lady kidnaps her. Because the Martian lady wants the flying potion too. Maybe to fly back home. Her planet needs her. My planet needs me. Honestly, I only recommend watching this one to hear Martian lady talk. It's so horrible, I can't even look because that alien delivery was the most amusing part of this Coraline ripoff. No rest, those witches! They destroyed my factory! Yeah, they destroyed her factory! Get him! No offense to the voice actor, thank you for putting on a funny performance. Props to you. We <laughs> Homewood. Ah, Disney's Homewood. No wait, not, not the 1993 dog movie. That was Homewood Bound, wasn't it? Oh. Oh, a shadow was named after that dog. It turns out we're not talking about Onward either. This is just Homeward, made in 2020. A very, very rough copy of Onward. As Double Toasted said in his review of this, We don't do our own thing. We do your thing. <laughs> we do your thing and we do it horribly. So our friends from the Asylum are back. This time they produced a slightly less scary looking movie. But you know, honestly, I actually had a bit of fun watching this one. It's just funnily stupid to see. Whatever single writing student they got to scribble out the script in 12 minutes, clearly they had some fun with their maniacally dim-witted fantasy story. How do I describe this? We start with stock Lord of the Rings beta footage with soldiers disguised as carrots stuck in the ground. And flying soldiers. Why do they fly? I never figured that out. But credit to the asylum, I, I didn't see that coming. Turns out we're looking at a war from long ago. Jump to present day, orcs and elves now live in quote unquote harmony, but the Elfdale school only has one single orc attending whom everyone seems to hate. Doing what all orcs do, getting into trouble. Huh, I think the asylum has just managed a message about the subtle tendrils of racial discrimination in modern day education. Or maybe orcs are just harder to animate. Yeah, that's possible too. To be fair, I'm not entirely sure they did animate their one orc in the school, as he seems to be a copy-pasted version of Wreck-It Ralph with sharp teeth. Our orc friend's name is Baal. He's gonna prank his brother Lloyd by sliming him on graduation day. But a side note I've gotta mention, there are some strange cameos here. Like the creator of the worst movie of all time, Freddy Got Fingered? He's here. It's Tom Green. I guess we all gotta pay the bills somehow. So like in Onward, there's the older brother and the younger brother. And they do a little magic and go on a road trip, and that's about it. 
There's a funny reason, though, that this doesn't follow the story of Onward better. You see, Homeward was made before Onward was released. So the Asylum basically looked at the trailer of Onward to try and piece together the story for it. Based on the few seconds of trailer footage we had, this is what we got. A kinda sorta buddy-buddy trip set in modern day with two brothers. Though Lloyd's reason for his trip with his brother is a little different. Unlike Onward, where the two brothers go on a road trip to connect with their dead father for a day, Lloyd takes his brother out into the city in the middle of the night to abandon him in another city because he's a pain in the rear. Whoa, kinda going a bit fast there. We're going on a road trip. No talking. Miss the mark a little bit on that one, Asylum. We'll see some crazy sights on this road trip. Frog tourists and biker orcs and... Actually, that's about it. There's actually not even that much magic in this movie, apart from one to two dust spells in the finale and, like, the flying we saw at the start of the movie. Homeward is definitely not good, but I'd call it the least offensive of the mockbusters so far. And I've got to say, props to the animator. Michael Johnson animated the entire movie himself. Holy cow, that is dedication. Props to you, Michael. Good or bad movie, that is an amazing achievement to do alone. Number four. <laughs> Trollland, aka Trolls. Oh dear, oh, no. we're, we're in for a doozy. So DreamWorks troll movies were based on the troll dolls from the 1950s. Troll dolls were also a big toy fad in the 90s. It kind of went on and off but DreamWorks bought the Troll line in 2013, only to release their first Trolls movie in 2016, and two more successful sequels after. And I gotta say, I do have a soft spot for the color and personality within these movies. I mean, it's not gonna win any awards, but... What, it won three? Says who? What's a Grammy Awards? Anyway, our buddies at the Asylum saw this and said, why not capitalize upon their success with Trolls? I'm starting to assume that Asylum is the only producers of these mockbusters. I mean, I assume Video Brinquado's gone. They haven't produced a movie in like 13 years. Anyway, Trolls, is it ugly? It's so ugly it breaks mirrors by winking at them. It is just hideous. Look at that face, man. That thing is nightmare fuel. And our troll abomination speaks with this strangely deep voice. You weren't planning on decking out of the ceremony, were you? No, of course not. Every single one of these trolls has these faces that look wrong. Even when we avert our gaze towards the humans, even they're somehow made to look deeply disturbing, mainly because of these strange hiccups in animation. As Double Toasted pointed out, Everyone looks like they're having constant muscle spasms. And yeah, all the characters constantly wriggle and writhe. Their bodies don't even touch the ground, they just float along. I guess that would have taken precious seconds of time to move them onto the ground. An asylum? They don't have time for that. Make them float. The problem I found a lot of critics seem to have with trolls is they can't look much beyond the animation, and I don't blame them. Is there a story there? Maybe. But none of us can escape the gaze of the writhing green unsightly horrors stealing our souls. But I'll try to give you as much story as possible. The trolls like to play pranks on humans. As the actor Dick Van Dyke announces, this is called Prankapalooza. It is time once again for the final hijinks of the year's Prankapalooza. They play pranks on humans every year, but Fen the troll doesn't like playing pranks on humans. And somehow the first human he sees doesn't cower in terror and they become friends. But a long-suffering park ranger has to deal with the trolls. And they're a brave ranger. Because apparently humans don't like being pranked every year by the mysterious green dead-eyed mucus people. So Fen the eternally hideous has to rescue his friends and family from the humans. Question, do you think anyone actually feels bad for the trolls here? I'm no diplomat, but maybe the trolls could try not continually annoying and pranking the humans till they finally attack back? No! Yeah, I thought as much. But you know, I don't actually think the Asylum were trying to only rip off DreamWorks trolls here. I think this is actually meant to be a cross-contaminated infectious biohazard of both Shrek and trolls. These characters look like they're meant to be Shrek ripoffs. Ripoffs that have gone horribly, horribly wrong, but Shrek ripoffs. And these little green infants look kinda, sorta, close to Shrek's kids, sort of. I mean, they failed miserably, you get my point. I wanna point out, Asylum, you definitely hired the wrong person for your Trolls project. Your Onward ripoff was animated by 
one person. And so far, it's the most visually attractive project you've managed. Clearly, Michael Johnson was the better candidate for the job here. And after we saw the internet's response to trolls, I suspect they did not get hired again. Don't be afraid, it's number three. Izzy's Way Home. So this is meant to capitalize on Finding Nemo, right? Yeah, with ugly fish. IMDB had a pretty good summary of this one too. What did it say, hon? An aquarium fish escapes her yacht home, unaware of the dangers that await her in the open ocean. She learns how to be true to herself. She also finds Nemo. Hang on, she does? I don't think so. I think IMDB just realises what utter copy-pasted crap this is. Yeah, they're not wrong. Much like Finding Nemo, there's an overprotective dad whose wife died, and he tells his child just how perfect she was. I'm sure she's most definitely dead, and definitely not waiting for them in the Coral Valley. Coral Reef, honey. Valley Reef, or anyway. There's of course a Nemo, except in a nice mockbuster twist, Nemo's a daughter now instead of a son. But to be fair though, that's like the only twist in the entire movie. Where you belong. A place I wouldn't have to hide? And where I'd have friends. The tricky thing about a mockbuster fish movie is Under the Sea is already a very foreign, unknown looking place to us humans. So it's harder for my imagination to fill in all the gaping gaps here. When they dial back the visuals to all these butt ugly blacks and greys, I just struggle to figure out where they are or what they're even doing. Anyway, Izzy and her ragtag team of racially diverse fish have many adventures in these gravelly dump grounds. Like they meet this thing right here. Yeah, what is it? It's an eel. Oh, but, but it's green, so I thought it was kelp. No, they're old eels. That doesn't make any sense. Why would eels turn green? Because it's a stupid movie. Yeah, well, whatever it is, its name is Ralph. Ralph! And like so many in this video, it's going to haunt my nightmares. Finally, they cross over the volcano to reach the Coral Valley. Reef. Whatever, they get attacked by a sea snake. But working together like good beta 3D models should, they beat it back. But then, shocker, Izzy and her father reunite with Izzy's mother, who we definitely didn't think was alive the whole time waiting for them. I've been here all this time. And they had me completely fooled. I thought she was dead as a doorknob. Much like Homewood, I give this mockbuster a solid 3 out of 10, which is stellar for these movies. Finding Nemo taught me to take the occasional risk and don't be afraid of an adventure. Izzy taught me whatever's really lurking in the depths of the ocean, at least it's got to be less ugly than this. Number 2. The Autobots. I present to you, definitely not cars. And tragically, it's the most charming production on this list. It's got a bit of aesthetic, you know? We start the movie with a nice cool Chinese pop opening. And what separates this mockbuster is, by jeebus, it actually looks different to all the others because it wasn't made by that infernal asylum company. And hey, at least the Chinese animators took the time to make the wheels move. Plus, unlike Cargo, I don't feel deeply defiled just looking at these things. My copy is unfortunately only in Chinese. My Chinese is bad, uh, well let's start with the story. What's the synopsis say, honey? It says, three cars with sentient artificial intelligence for the ultimate interaction with humans. That sentence doesn't make sense. This movie doesn't make sense. Well, clearly neither side in this case can speak the other's language. The best synopsis we could get was three cars are made with self-awareness and they go on an adventure to discover humankind is driven by friendship. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha! Driven by friendship. But what I appreciate here is this story clearly isn't the same as Cars. Maybe visually they were cashing in on Cars' popularity by giving them the same general look as Pixar's Cars. But rather than a world of talking cars, this is a story about three cars created with artificial intelligence like Astro Boy. And that actually interests me. That's an interesting concept. That's right, it may be controversial, but conceptually, this mockbuster interests me more than the original car Pixar movie. Instead of a Western cliche like the Pixar version of Cars, it's instead based on an Eastern cliche. 
A robot AI discovering self-awareness and wanting to understand humans and find friendship. Yeah, that's a cliche in the East. It's kind of awesome. If I may be completely transparent with you, I was more disappointed by the shallow reviews than the movie itself. Many IMDb reviewers barely gave Autobots a surface look and said things like, This ripoff is worse than Cars 2. Autobots is the worst Chinese ripoff ever done by another human being. It's an ripoff Oto Mediocre Cars sequel that proved Pixar is not perfect. Yes, but why is it bad? I thought Cars 2 was bad. This is one of the worst animated films ever. Use your words. Can you explain? What makes it bad? Did you dislike the characters? Was the story boring to you? Are they actually watching these movies or are they just parroting this stuff from another reviewer? I can describe the movie. Sort of. It's, uh, it involves two races that never take their helmets off. They create three sentient cars. And, and the pink car, the stand-in for Lightning McQueen, dreams of winning a race in the championship. He comes back to race again, fails, crashes. But then the three sentient cars combine their powers into the ultimate race. And honestly, I have no idea why Pink Car is so bummed about this race. It's not very high stakes. No one showed up to watch it. That stadium is empty. Oh no, wait, th these four people magically appeared in the front row. Well, they, at least someone showed up. In defense of the reviewers, I get there's a big language barrier with this movie. I had to work hard to figure out what was actually going on here. And yeah, the animation wasn't helping. Autobots even does something I've never seen a mockbuster do before. It often slows the frames down to a crawl randomly. Maybe the renderer broke and they said, to hell with that, we are not rendering this. That will take pennies of electricity. But again, props to them, this is still a lot less ugly than Cargo. But anyway, let's prepare for the worst of all. Ah, oh, this one, number one. Finding Jesus. I thought there was only one studio left producing mockbusters. I was wrong. But I, I really wish I'd been right. May I present Wow Now Visuals, your number one source for torturously transparent religious agendas. It's fantastic. Ha ha ha, me. But despite the title Finding Jeebus, we see a whole lot of demons in this movie. Every character. I started by watching the trailer for this movie. God leads by example. Jesus keeps his promises. All things are possible through Jesus. And this trailer is still one of the most annoying things I've ever seen in my life. It was a one minute trailer. And I continually rage quitted to the point where I could only get through about 10 seconds at a time. I never thought I'd say this, but this was so annoying, I'd actually take breadwinners over this. Buckle up, ducky. At least those hyperactive lunatic ducks speak their mind. What's that? Why is this the feces gluteal cleft of all modern mockbusters? Well, I imagine the title probably gave it away. How do you describe this dialogue? Jesus sure has blessed us with lives in such a beautiful underwater universe. You little fish sure have your minds in the right place. Up there he is. I know, I'm sorry, but these particular cartoon creators just really loved their religion. And they wanted to tell all the children about their religious idol from their stories. It's a feel-good mission. In Jesus' name, amen. How do I better describe this dialogue? Imagine sugary maple syrup. Then cover that maple syrup in more sugar, then smother that with high fructose corn syrup. Then cover that in concentrated sweetener to the point where it tastes like you're drinking metal. That is probably one-tenth as syrupy, saccharine sweet as this dialogue. I see your point. I never get crabby when I remember to regularly thank Jesus for everything. In this movie, I don't feel so much I'm watching free-thinking characters, but these creepy brainwashed servants that have drunk the Kool-Aid. No, they've dunked their heads in the Kool-Aid and then snorted the Kool-Aid up their nose, shaking it into their head after. And I assume if I turn my back, these zealots are going to tie me up and sacrifice me to their god, Isaac Stark. Stop again, zealots! 
by not losing sight of the simple blessings Jesus has been. Why does everyone talk like this? And rest assured, Jesus is very, very pleased with you. How do you know that? Did he magically tell you? Oh, jeepers, I'm already a page into writing and we're not even three minutes into this syrupy, torturous hour of preachy madness on shrooms. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. The love of humanity! Somebody put me out of my misery! I can't stand it anymore! I can't stand it! So the yellowfish and bluefish have to get to the bottom of why this guy's so unhappy. Yeah, he sure looks unhappy, doesn't he? I don't know how he's keeping it together, he looks so miserable. You seem down in the dumps. It's a shame he has the same creepy, emotionlessly happy plastic doll face as the rest of them. It's not really getting its point across very well. Anyway, it just goes on like this for 67 minutes. No action, no depth, no particularly profound emotional character changes. Just these two with their creepy blank faces talking with each character they meet about their religious idol, Jeebus. I don't know about you, but there's only one way I'd describe those faces, and it ain't pretty. Join us, Father. Yeah, that. Nuff said. The only way they could have saved this movie for me is if it turned out the entire tribe was a bunch of religious cultist fish that were about to be fished out of the ocean for tuna sandwiches. And I got to watch the fishermen eat the tuna sandwiches after grounding them up. And let's finish on a quote from our favorite religious fish with slightly different visuals. God leads by example. I am inevitable. And if you have any comments on your experience of these movies, emphasis on your experience, I'd love to hear about it. Hell, tell me how your day was, how you're feeling. And on the off chance you're one of the few people who might remember me covering animated ripoffs seven years ago, thank you for sticking around or coming back after all this time. Either way, I appreciate you. And as always, thanks for watching and hope I might see you again. What? Look after. At first, I wanted to do the member question from Sergeant 16 Bits, who asked what shenanigans Nin's cat Shadow gets up to. Unfortunately, the lazy old bum barely moves except for his pats and food, so he doesn't really get up to anything. So let's answer MXOY99's question, who asked which of these ripoffs was the most original from the movie it was ripping off. At first, I was thinking Autobots, but I'd actually unfortunately have to say Finding Jeebus, as it was only really Finding Nemo in appearance. On a side note, at first I thought this movie must have been a bomb, but apparently it got a sequel. This Finding Jeebus too. So we may yet visit these religious cult fish again in the future. If this video gets low views, the silver lining will be I'll never have to visit Finding Jeebus again. So either outcome, at least I get some joy.